you see, there's this party she's giving tomorrow, and we were going to, I mean, today she's giving a party, and uh, we were going to announce the engagement then, and then do it later on. But that seems like such a hack's way of getting married. So what we're going to do, we're just going to drive upstate or over to Jersey or wherever it is that you do it, and uh, do it. Mm -hmm. I like it. You know, it's funny, but all my life I've been either too busy or too careful to get married. But now, all of a sudden, I just, I just can't wait. Just, uh, just can't wait. Of course, I, I imagine it'll be a little strange at first, because uh, it, uh, well, you know, it'd be sort of like somebody reading over your shoulder all the time. <clears throat> But, uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm allergic to your cat. <clears throat> if it was anybody else but Merle, of course, I, <clears throat> I'd be scared stiff. For one thing, she has such wonderful taste. Clothes, books, everything. And she paints very well, too. She paints in this sort of cloudy style. She did a portrait of me last year. She was crazy about it. So I just never did tell her that I was upside down. I've known her ever since she was a kid. And then, of course, she went away to school and I still lost track of her. Wow. And Happy holidays and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com and this is my good friend and co-host Margot D. of Brooklyn Fitchick. Hi, everyone. It's December. Finally. Our stockings are up. I've, I've, I've taken down the fall. I've put up all my Christmas plates on my plate wall. Um, we are really holidaying it up over here, even though it's still like 70 degrees because um, I live in San Diego. I'm very excited. We've done this show for almost 10 years. <laughs> and from the beginning, we've always done all holiday movies in December, which means we have done a great number of holiday movies. We thought we'd done all of them, but there's always more because mm -hmm. people are always making more. But um, I'm super excited because I had forgotten, I had completely forgotten that the movie that we're talking about today was a holiday movie, um, but it totally is. We'll get to that in just a minute. But if you're brand new and you saw the title of this episode and you were like, oh, I didn't know Bell, Book and Candle was a book. It really wasn't technically it was a broadway play and um with a very interesting backstory but uh, here's the deal when we started this uh i mean when we started the, the pandemic like a few years ago back now i'm sure we all recall, recall when that happened we decided to do a brand new episode every single week and that means we had to expand what we mean when we say quote unquote book and so we are considering any movie that has been adapted from any kind of literary source. So that means it could be a novella, it could be a short story, it could be a nonfiction book, it could be a song, it could be a magazine article, it could be a play. So today we're going to be talking about Bell, Book, and Candle based on the play of the same name. We are still looking for suggestions for the rest of this month. Even though we have a fun episode planned for next week, um, there's lots of movies that you are always thinking of and giving us great ideas. If you have suggestions for episodes that you would like us to cover, especially if they're holiday uh, centered and you would like to meet other listeners of this podcast or interact with us, there are several places on the internet where that's possible. We do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it, but we're much more interactive in our Facebook group. You type in Book VS Movie Podcast Group and ask to join. It's a private group. Thaddeus was very generous to put two to post the very top of that page. One is a list of episodes we've already covered, and the other is a list of ideas. But as Margo said, we're always looking for ideas. We cover poems and songs and magazine articles, anything you can think of. So you could you know post it there if you like, or we are on social media at Book Versus and 
movie on Twitter as long as that exists, on Threads and on Blue Sky, I believe. I'm getting one for Blue Sky, Instagram, book versus a movie. And also we have an old timey email book versus movie podcast spelled it all out at gmail.com we just ask that the book be pretty easy for us to get our hands on and the movie needs to be streaming on a major app this one is on Tubi, which is a free app <laughs> which i literally just learned about from margo yes. this week i was like where is this movie she's like it's on Tubi. i'm like great what's that <laughs> it's december 1st sometimes the thing that was streaming the day before is not streaming the day you want to watch it so that's just how it goes it's also on the criterion collection by the way the one we have today anyway so all those places you can just reach out to us also if you would just like some stickers uh, give us your address via the email and we will drop them in the mail for you and if you really enjoy the show and like to help keep us in books and movies you can also support us on patreon P-A-T-R-E-O-N. As Margo said, we've been doing the show for about nine years now. We've decided that with our basic feed, that RSS feed, we will have two years worth of shows and also a bunch of holiday shows that are there for you. Everything else we start to put on the Patreon wall, so everything two years previous. And so we have stuff in there like Frankenstein. We have Silence of the Lambs. We have uh, Urban Cowboy, because that was based on a magazine article. We've just got a really an amazing array of episodes. They're there. We really appreciate everyone that signs up there. Also, if things are tight, though, if money's tight, we get it. This time of year can be a little crazy. If you could just leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, you know, some stickers, stars, wherever they have you do, that would be amazing. And if you want to learn about some bonus material for every episode, we also now have a weekly Substack newsletter, um, bookversusmovie.substack.com. I already know what this week's is going to be about. I'm very excited. It's going to be cool. But let's get into today's book and movie. We're talking about Bell, Book, and Candle, which people talk about all the time during Halloween, mm -hmm. but it's actually... Something that has nothing to do with Halloween. It's a Christmas show. It's about witchcraft. So people think it's about that. It's also, I mean, it's a Christmas movie, but it's 1958 when they film it. It has its own kind of design, design to it that's just incredibly fabulous. Let's talk about our author first. He's fascinating. His name is John Van Druten. He was born June 1st, 1901 in London, England. He eventually came to America. He's a playwright. He was a theater director. He wrote, I Remember Mama. He also hmm. wrote, uh, I Am a Camera, which became Cabaret eventually. Margo and I talked about that when we talked about Cabaret, when we do our month of musical musicals in March. That's what we usually cover. He lived, sadly, only to be 56. He, he died because he had a, a heart condition, and the ranch where he was living at the time, which is in Indio, California, uh, I think that's near, is it Coachella or Coachella? I think you could say it either way. Most people say Coachella. I think you can see it either way, and it's it's... The point is, especially in those days, it was out there. Like it, it, nothing was there. No, if it's an emergency and you're out in Indio in nineteen fifty, where was it fifty seven? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He had heart issues, so that apparently was a part of it. But he left the the ranch that was there. He left them the rights to I Am a Camera, which became. But like I said, cabaret. So in the 70s, they started making a lot of money from that. For So good for them. But fascinating, man. Lots of amazing movie. I'm sorry. Uh, screenplays. He's written screenplays. He's written plays. And uh, that's John Van Druten, our writer today. And if you're only familiar with the movie and um, have never seen this play, we, Margo and I were just discussing um, the various community theater productions that we, we love. We when love a community – shout out. Like, listen – if you are somebody who's involved in a community theater somewhere, especially in the U.S., but really anywhere, um, please put your shows on YouTube. Yes. We enjoy them so much. <laughs> and I always love learning about not just the, you know, not just watching the show because it's always fun to see the show, especially if you're reading a play, to see it kind of in 3D, if you will, to see it brought to life um, is really important. But I also really love learning about these different communities and the theaters that they're supporting. Like always go and like learn about the town. And I just it's a whole fun nerd and out. There are me. some great actors out there that you know never get like, you know, they don't become world famous or something. But we saw one. Uh, I saw a production of Misery that was in, I believe, Lincoln, Nebraska, that like knocked my socks off. Like yeah. really, really good. 
yeah, there's some good stuff out there. Um, so originally, so what we're saying is you can watch this on YouTube. You can watch the play version. There's some pretty big, just kind of differences of mostly the setting because the play just the biggest difference is the play takes all takes place within Jillian's basically studio apartment. I mean, it's, it's, you see the whole apartment in the set and all of the action takes place there. There's never a second location that anybody goes. And um, there are way fewer characters. There are only one, two, three, four, five actors in the play, um, which if you've seen the movie, there's many, many, many characters that are added for, for, for Hollywood. Um, now, originally this was uh, debuted at the Ethel Barrymore Theater in 1950 and our stars were Lily Palmer, and her husband, for the for the moment, <laughs> <laughs> Rex Harrison. Rex Harrison, um, who we've talked about numerous times on this show, was a notorious womanizer. And I think he was married. He was married like at least five times, right? Oh, yeah. And, and, and an egomaniac as oh, well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. She's, I think she's his second wife. Mm. Um, so they weren't married that long, but they were married during the production of this show. So you had Jillian, our main character, who's played by Kim Novak in the movie. You have Shep, who's played by J- uh, Jimmy Stewart. I almost said Jimmy Hendrix. Jimmy Stewart in the movie. That'd be amazing. You have the aunt. Aunt, what's the aunt's name? Queenie. Queenie, thank you. And you have Nikki, the brother. And then you have the author, Sydney Redlich. And that's it that's in the play. And so in the play, unlike in the movie... Um, Jillian or Gillian, they say, right? It's like a hard G. Gillian is doesn't own a, a like kooky store of exotica. She owns that apartment building, or she's the landlady or or manager of Super. the apartment building. Super, basically. And um, Shep lives upstairs from her, but he's she's his landlady. She's home. She's kind of like with she's got her kitty pie pie whacket. Um which I don't know, what is the significance of the I name? looked it up. I you know? No, I, I did look it up, but I, then I forgot oh, about you? it quickly. Sure. I thought you might, because it's a kitty. It is a kitty. I do like my kitties. But yeah, the, the kitty's name is Pie Wacket. Um, we later learned that it's he's more than a pet, right? But um, so she's kind of talking to her kitty like, oh, I'm just not really happy with my life, the way things are. I just wish I could meet somebody different than the kind of normal, the people that I normally hang out with. And, oh yeah, somebody like the guy who lives upstairs. And then he, he turns up, he knocks on the doorway and he complains that uh, he complains to his landlady, you know, cause she's his landlady that um, he came home to find one of the, a woman who, another woman who lives in the building in his apartment. (laughs) So he's complaining about it to the landlady. Right. And the landlady's like, oops, sorry, that's my aunt. <laughs> the pie whacket, I'll by the way. With her. It's uh, I just looked it up. It's a supposed oh. it's a familiar sp- spirit of an alleged witch. Uh, General oh. Matthew Hopkins in Essex, England, sixteen forty four. So that's why they picked the name. Interesting. Oh, so it has like a it has like a witchy history. Yes. Mm, okay. Yeah, I thought it wasn't just made up. Mm-hmm. Anyway, really rather banal conversation with him about like you would with your landlady or landlord. And the aunt turns up at the end of the, that scene. And she, so she gets, you know, Gillian gives the aunt a talking to about going into other people's apartments as one would. <laughs> and um, and then Shep's like, okay, thanks for taking care of it. And he leaves and the aunt's like, oh, I see you like him. Ah, okay. And the aunt puts a spell on Shep's phone so that his phone no longer works so he has to come back um to see about getting his phone fixed and that's when he calls his fiance right merle merle so we never meet merle in the show he only he has a couple of conversations with her on the telephone which he conveniently has in gillian's apartment which is the only scene in the play the only set um because his phone is broken because the queenie has put a spell on it see how it all kind of works out uh, for the audience <laughs> and the set designer, I guess, of a show than the than the movie, I would say. Like, it's a lot less. There's a lot more going on, a lot more eye candy in the movie than than in the play. It's kind of 
it's kind of like a it's like a homey little ordinary kind of a show, right? It's a romance. It's a rom com. Yeah. It's it's kind of frothy, and uh, and I I can imagine like trying to sell witchcraft in the nineteen fifties. Like it's so innocent what she does and what her brother does. Like they just turn lights yeah. on and off. But the one thing that they do say is that the drawback because I'm like, well, what's the drawback if I could just make because they conjure everything they want and right and you're like this is great why would you why wouldn't we all be doing this right and their but their whole thing is that it doesn't make you quite human and because you're not quite human you can't fall in love and they can't blush and and they can't cry right you also don't don't experience the uh, the full range of human emotions including love and joy you know like they're they're amused right by certain things but they're not like delighted, um, ecstatic about anything. Yeah. So it's a very, um, so, you know, as they're messing with people's lives, they don't really, it's just like, nah, something to do. Right. (laughs) They get bored, but she, they get bored. And so kind of out of boredom and kind of because, um, Shep's fiance is an old college, uh, frenemy of Gillian's Gillian puts, um, a love spell on Shep to bust up her, former frenemies uh future marriage Shep falls in love with her so tame like right he he gets like doing he gets like a love <laughs> like a love spell and you know he's like whoa you, you know like Gillian you're beautiful I hadn't noticed <laughs> and then like the lights go out and then the lights go back up and we all kinds of stuff is supposed to have happened but we're not going to get to see any of it <laughs> they're just they're just cuddling on the sofa now and she's gradually sort of like She's having feelings, but she doesn't really know what that is, you know, or, or it's been so long or whatever. And uh, we don't get any details as to how one becomes a part of that witchy society. Um, so we don't know, like, was it a choice that she made? Was it foisted upon her? Was it her fa- We don't know. There's she no has a Harry brother. Potter backstory. No, no, nothing of the kind. Right. She has a brother named Nikki, who is a warlock. So we have two witches and a warlock. And Shep is a publisher, and he is talking about this book called uh, something of Mexico, Magic of Mexico, Mm -hmm. I think is what it's called. And this author named uh, Redlich, Sydney Redlich, sorry, Sydney Redlich. And Shep mentions like, oh, wow, I'd love to publish that guy's next, it's like printing money, like publish this guy's next book. And so Gillian's like, oh, I'm going to make that happen. So she casts a spell and Sidney Redlich shows up and lo and behold, he wants to write a book about witchcraft. And that worries Gillian. Gillian does not want him poking around exposing witches um, because, you know, that hasn't really worked out so well for witches (laughs) over like (laughs) human history. Um, So she puts Nikki, her brother, to work to put the kibosh on that. But instead, what he does is become a collaborator slash ghostwriter with Mr. Redlich. Turns out he Um, wants to be a writer. Turns out he wants, he would love to be a writer. Who doesn't? Who doesn't? So, so it's anyway, what I'm saying is like, it's all a lot of the same plot points, but in a much smaller, calmer, it's very like conversational. The, you know, there's not a lot of hysterics. There's not a lot of smoke and mirrors and or any things of that nature they're basically just talking about witchcraft and doing a little bit of like mumbling and glaring and um and that's the magic that's going on there's nothing there's no like special effects per se you know not of not of like a huge not like anything like in the movie yeah i mean the plot points are basically the same she tells Shep that she's a witch and that she had cast a spell. He naturally is very insulted by this because he thought we were in love and you were just getting even with your old college uh, enemy. And um, I'm just stuck in the middle here. And did you even have any feelings for me anyway? And so they break up for a little. Yeah, legitimate. They break up for a while. And then it's, we have like a span of about, oh, and we should say all of that. The, the play opens on Christmas Eve. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so there's also like Christmassy things. Um, So then it's like a couple of months later, Mm -hmm. a couple months go by that they don't see each other. And he comes back just to kind of check on her and get some of his stuff that's still in the building. She's different. He's like, what's up? What the, how come, you know, cause he does have feelings for her. So he's, you know, he's trying to find out what's happening and, and she is very not forthcoming about what's going on with her, but we know that she has lost her witchy power. Uh, because apparently 
That's my the first I've heard of it. That if you're a witch, uh, I don't know what the warlock rule is, but if you're a witch, this wasn't in Harry Potter, um, and fall in love, you lose your powers. Right. So she has lost her powers. So she's no longer a witch um, because she had genuinely fallen in love with Shep, which was a surprise even to herself. Realizes he loves her too. And they embrace and curtain. Druden said he wanted to make something darker at the time, like the, and have, but uh, he just decided that part of, part of falling in love and being with another person is giving up some of yourself. True. And yep. that's true. I mean, I think what she gives up, I mean, I would find very hard to give up myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> As you said, it does sort of show the society, like there are drawbacks. That that it does show that that like lack of ability to have these highs and lows of emotion or, or even just like a range of human emotion is is shown as a drawback or she at least feels like it's a drawback. It doesn't feel like it's a humongous personal loss that she's lost her powers. But yeah, still. It's a bummer. Yeah, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a bummer. And Shep isn't like, he's not like, yay, you're not a witch anymore. Now we can be together. He's like, oh, gosh, are you okay? How right. do you feel about that? You know, he's he's concerned about it because the witch part was not the issue. It was the fact that she was trying to, you know, he thought she had feelings when she was actually trying to get revenge on um his fiance. So um, the witchcraft part was just kind of incidental as far as he was concerned. Quite a successful show. Yeah. It I was... think it would be with Rex Harrison. <laughs> I bet he's fun. I bet he's, he was amazing to watch on stage. I, yeah. But it, yeah, it does very well and it runs for half a year and, and it's like I said, it's got big stars in it. And so John Van Druten, sold the rights and they made a movie at it. But this is, you know, America's really different between 1950 and 1958 when it's yeah. being produced as a film. And this is the second that year that had Kim Novak and Jimmy Stewart because they made Vertigo that year. Just what? for this little film called Vertigo. I mean. Show. With like weird supernatural elements in it too. It's not my favorite Hitchcock. I mean, nor mine. Yeah. I know. I don't and go back to shame. it. I don't either. And, and uh, every now and again, like I have to watch it for some reason. I don't know why, like something comes up that I, for some reason I have to watch it. And I'm always kind of struck that, well, I don't like Jimmy Stewart's character. That's, mm -hmm. that's a big part of it is he's yucky. Like what he does to Kim Novak is gross. And, um, but but as far as like the acting and the performances, I think every single actor in it is super good. Like they're really good performances. But it, it's just the story, like the obsessiveness of it. I just find icky and I don't like watching it. Well, that's also because of Hitchcock and the way he treated his yeah. actresses. And that's how he yeah. felt about them. So that's part of it. I mean, it's a gorgeous looking film, of course. I mean, oh, it, yeah. you need to see it if you're a film person at all. You do need to, to see this in person. But oh, the art direction is amazing. Camera work. Um, yeah. And, you know, the locations are great. Yeah. I just don't like that relationship of the, of, of um, the, the, the Jimmy Stewart and Kim Novak's um, characters in the movie. Um, yeah. It's just that it's, I guess it's the script I don't like. Yeah. No, yeah. it's not great. Yeah. It's but they fun. certainly. There's nothing fun no. about it when there's a lot of no, fun not for in, a moment. in Hitchcock it's just movies a bummer. normally. Yeah. 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 The, you're right. There's not a lot of, like, even Psycho has, like, moments of levity. Of, and, and the birds. You know, and the birds. Absolutely <laughs> the birds. But one thing is they do have chemistry. Yeah. Those two do have some some for real chemistry. So it's a delight to see them in this kind of a fun, more fluffy kind of a thing. And um, and we forget that Jimmy Stewart is so good at fun and fluffy, you know, because he's done so many other kinds of things that uh, he, that, but to see him be fun and fluffy as an older Jimmy Stewart is very fun, I think. He said he, that he didn't think he was right for the role because he was too, he was 50 and uh, at the time and, and this is a 5850. Like you really look like 
f- people 50 yeah. now look much, much younger. 50, and he'd served in World War II. Right. He, yeah, there's a lot of st- living. He's packed into 50, yes. Right. So he was like twice her age. And so and I think he felt like that that was part of it. But this this film was so gorgeous. Let's play the trailer and then we'll talk about this movie. this cat got anything better to do? Couldn't you give him something to read? I'm more in love with you than I've ever been with anyone. I'm Sidney Redlich. You don't know me, but uh, I think I want to see you. Good evening, gentlemen. You startled me. Ring the bell, close the book, quench the candle. I'm one. You're one what? One of the people that the book's about, and Nikki's one too. You're naive, boy, you know. They 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 got these little trade secrets. They, Got them right there, close and tight. They're not gonna, I could never get near a deal like that. You, you are nearer than you think. Jeff, I will. I'd like to hear that again. I want to. And I'll be different from now on, I swear, I promise. I don't want you any different. Not at all. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be quite different. No, I won't stand for it. Richard Quine is our director. Uh, the script is by Daniel Teradash. And guess who our cinematographer is? Hmm. James Wong Howe. Who we've talked about, like, How sweet smell of time? success. I mean. How does he have time to make all the movies? Is what I want to know. That we're watching. So it is, we have James Stewart, Kim Novak, Jack Lemon plays her brother. It's a very odd choice, but he's so adorable. It's Okay. The cast of this movie. So good. I haven't seen this movie in a very long time. Um, so, yes, we've got Kim Novak as Gillian. Kim Novak is like perfect, witchy, inscrutable, stunning. Like, Beyond you cannot stunning. take your eyes off of her. Yeah. yeah. Jimmy Stewart, we just talked about. Jack Lemon is, is at first, you're like, okay, all right, all right. He's great as her brother, as the warlock. Um, and he, he and um, so Ernie Kovacs is playing uh, the the crazy author of um, Magic in Mexico, Sidney Redlich. Ernie Kovacs and Jack Lemon were best friends. So they have fantastic chemistry. So there's a lot of moments of, and none of that is in the play at all. Sidney and Nikki, the brother, those two guys together who are good. Now they're going to collaborate on this book. Jack Lemon is the warlock. That's like taking the author around the witchy world. And it's so much fun. It is so much fun. And, oh, here's another weird thing. So Ernie Kovacs was married to Edie. What's her name? She's absolutely wonderful. Edie Adams. Edie Adams. So Ernie Kovacs, uh, for those of you who don't know, he was a comedy John, way ahead of his time, super like conceptual. He had a, a very successful television show. Um, 
he had a I forget what the name of his first wife was, but he had a first wife that they had a, they had two two daughters I think, and it didn't last long. And uh, the the first wife had a lot of mental health issues, and so they get a divorce, and Ernie Kovacs is awarded custody of the two girls. Like this was unheard of, which is very unheard the, of. Yeah, for the very 50s, unheard yeah. of. So he wins custody. He marries Edie Adams, and the first wife kidnaps the girls. And it, it, it's a while before they're able to track them down. And there's this whole trial. And it, it, as they're fighting, no, no, the trial's later, sorry. Um, so the girls come home. They're living with Edie and Ernie. Ernie dies in a car crash. Yeah, like just a few he's years like, after this movie. Not long after this movie at all. He's, he's at the, like the peak of his career. And he's killed in a car crash. He was driving a Chevy Corvair, famously a dangerous car like it's like the example of a of a dangerous car design um and after he dies the first wife sues for custody back but the girls don't want to go with her they want to stay with Edie and so Edie keeps the girls and she's a remarkable woman Ernie dies with like all this debt and Edie yes. works and like pays everybody back but anyway all of this is to say I'll go, I'm taking a very long road to say this is a weird like whoa, whoa, whoa. so Ernie Kovacs is married to Edie Adams when he makes this film and Edie Adams after his death, she marries another guy for a little while. And then her last husband, her third and last husband is Pete Candoli, who is one of the musicians that plays in the Zodiac club Oh my goodness. in this movie. So when, when uh, Jack Lemon is playing the bongos and the, the two guys, the, these are two brothers that he's playing. She's married to one of those brothers. So one of those guys is her future husband oh that's wild <laughs> and that's, um but anyway so and then we've got the we've got the the old the elder witches who is one of whom is is only um talked about in the play right um, hermione hermione gingold and um and then elfa uh lanchester who we've talked about a couple of times right she's come up a couple of times mary we poppins her. And uh, mm-hmm. there's a couple of there's she's Katie Nana and Mary Poppins. She's in Bride of Frankenstein. Bride of Frankenstein, and there's another one that we covered that she was in. Yeah, she's her close ups are great. She's so expressive. I think she's just so beautiful. And then Janice Rule, who only did a few parts, and she's she's, she's in this too. She's fantastic in this movie. It's super good. You know what? She's really good. We yeah. talked about her when we talked about the swimmer. That's um, it. That's it. And Janice Rule. Yes. She was amazing in The Swimmer. Yeah, when I saw that name, I was like, I know we've talked about her, Janice Rule. Who is in the? Um, she's great in this. She's the, she's, she, you, you totally buy that these two women knew each other and that they have this like history of tit for tat and that they, you know, they just have never gotten along, just like just oil and water. She's great. She's, she's great. I love that how much we get to see of her in this. So the the movie is set in New York City, and we get to see there are a couple of shots of New York City here. I mean, New York is nineteen fifty eight. Oh my god! Top of the the uh, the what's the building? I'm thinking a flat iron bu- building with Madison Square Park. There's just some shot, and I know some of it was on the studio set, but some of the it's not. And it's it's great. It really adds to it the hipster vibe of you know this guy loves bongos. It's the sort Vertigo of Club. beatnik-y. It's beatnik adjacent. I love that she's again like the the oddly the play is sort of like a kitchen sink kind of thing. You yeah. know, it's it's very domestic. Like it's you're always just in her little apartment. Um, I love that we've glammed her up and she's got this like her, exotic okay. artifacts. Okay, Christmas tree goals. Oh, can we just first of all, whoever designed this Christmas tree, whoever designed this movie, period. It's it, the art it's direction brilliant. is art direction is is spectacular, stunning. Yeah. It's it's mid century, but a, with a twist, kind of. Oh, uh, and so she's got this this kind of space age. Uh, why are they not selling this tree? Why <laughs> do I not own one, even a little one for my desk? Yeah. Um, but I love that they have this. She's got this tree with the metal and the and the gold tone. And and um, she and the witches, because they celebrate Christmas, too. Um, we're not acting like this is any like this might as well be a Douglas fir for nobody's like 
at pretending like this tree is not jaw droppingly modern cutting edge. Uh, we're just like, oh, the Christmas tree. Her I love clothes, it. Are the oh, her wardrobe. Oh my god! Talk about it's, timeless and the chic. The velvet gown with the bangles, and then the black number with the with the with the red rose chiffon and the matching red rose shoes. The the leopard print, the yes. backless dress that she wears. Oh, I mean, anyone, everything. We, everything. Anyone Even the end when she comes out and she's in the like white dress with the yellow, like very, very you um, wear all that Americana. Oh. All of it. But she's like, she looks like a model. I mean, she's just everything about her. And she's she, so beautiful and she's so graceful. Gorgeous. Like she's just sitting on the sofa, but she looks like a freaking sculpture. She's <laughs> just, oh. And the Siamese cat, which uh, there's the several. Cat. But her, I mean, Siamese cats are so beautiful. They, with the blue eyes and everything. That's her cat. Uh, mm-hmm. There were several cats used. I don't think any cats were hurt in production. I think, like, when I read the notes, I'm like, yeah, it sounds like one of them wasn't, ch- you know, chasing them with, don't chase them with a broom, people. It's, it's When they make oh. that sound, it's not good. That yeah, let's not do that. Let's not yeah. do that, yeah. Jimmy Stewart with the salt and pepper hair. I mean, just, he's such a dreamboat. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> He really is. And one of the things I really love, I mean, I love the, that we get to see, we get to go places with these characters. It doesn't always work. We've talked about this a few times where you take a book to movie or you take a play to movie that is a small, cozy play or book. And we try to add a lot of locations and new people. And, and sometimes it's unwieldy. I think this is like just the right amount. And I love so much... And maybe it's because I've seen the movie before I read the play. It, sometimes that, you know, influences the way we do this. But um, I love that we see him walk in on the ant in his house. Yes. Like the scene with Jimmy Stewart and Elsa Lanchester is so delightful. Whereas in the in the play, he's just telling her, he's just telling Gillian about it. And it's not, it's like, okay. He talks about like, oh, she's making noises, and she, and Gillian's like, oh, can you understand them? And he's like, no, and you know, so it's just not as fun. Whereas to actually see them, and he's saying to the woman directly, what are you doing up there? Oh, you left your window open. He's like, okay, but why are you suddenly <laughs> lying? <laughs> it's Christmas Eve. She's just like hanging out by his desk, looking through his things. But that's when uh, Kim Novak meets him, Gil Gillian. And she thinks he's handsome. You know, she's thinking to herself, they start the movie. She, I'm going to go back to the clothes. She's got this red coat and holding the cat and she's by the Christmas tree. This she's Christmas. in like her grubby clothes, which are right? stunning. And the <laughs> lavender in her hair. It's genius. But she's sort of like, I'm bored. What do you think I should ask for Kitty? Because she can get whatever she wants. She's a witch. <laughs> There's no drawback to me. So she, but she's like, maybe a man, maybe I need a romance or something. She meets Jimmy Stewart. He tells her, you know, your aunt was in my apartment. She goes, all right, I, I'll see what's going on. And the aunt thinks he's cute too. And maybe like she's trying to throw a little romance into the air. I love it when they go to the Vertigo Club, which you don't get in the play. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and they only, again, they are only in Gillian's apartment talking about it. Right. And in the play, it's called the Cloven Hoof Club. In the movie, I love that it. it's the Zodiac Club and you have to tell your birth date to get in. I love Genius. it. Genius. <laughs> Seul au fond de la scène, je commence à m'ennuyer. En vain, je me démène pour pouvoir me libérer. Dix ans dans la même pause, je vous assure que c'est long. Depuis que je me décompose, je fais peur aux poissons qui fichent le camp sans rémission. Je suis un noyé assassiné par un gars qu'on voulait à mon porte-monnaie. Je n'avais pas un centime, lui pour cacher son crime, il me jeta dans l'abîme. Et depuis, je m'abîme dans cette masse d'eau. Je suis un noyé assassiné, j'ai au cou un boulet m'empêchant de remonter. Parler d'une aventure, voilà dix ans que ça dure, avec ça je vous jure. It's not supposed to be known, but he's from the Paris chapter. Encore, si on m'avait flanqué dans un tonneau au lieu d'eau, il y avait eu du vin clairet. 
mais non, mes chers redeviennent molles. Je me désole et je m'étiole, la scène ne charrie pas l'alcool. This is a charming little number about a man who was assassinated and thrown into a river. That was ten years ago, and there he's been all this time, at the bottom, without food, alcohol, or a female friend. Une mignonnette, rien que des petits poissons qui fichent un camp sans rémission. In addition, he detests water. Dans cette crapule, voilà que je bascule dans l'eau qui fait les bulles et me fout la ridicule. You won't catch her at El Morocco. She looks like she's been living in a pickle barrel. Me plaît mon pêche en remontée. Vous qui moyez, plaignez, plaignez. Tous les noyés, assassinés, plaignez. And you go in, and it's just what I think a club would look like, a hipster club the in 19... 19- the French guy, the, the French guy with his... What is he doing? It's amazing. It's a performance. He's playing a song, and I was I put it on Spotify, you know, just to, to play it. And it is about a French assassin. Of course it is. And he's all in black, like very slim, and just doing this yeah. dance. It's like the interpretive dance as he's singing. Ugh. And then they have the older lady, Hermione, who's like sort of talking to people in the crowd, like describing what the song is. He's talking about this. He's talking about that. And Jimmy Stewart shows up with Janice Rule. That's his fiance. And he's like, I'm, we're going to get married because, you know, it's probably time. Yeah, I'm 50. It's time, you know. So she comes into the club. She's like, why are we at the lanes? Why are we at the Monaco? Like, what are we doing here? He goes in there and and, uh, Kim Novak is there with her brother and he's playing the bongos. She's like, what is this place? And then she says, oh, I recognize you. I believe Miss Kittredge and I know each other. Oh, I don't seem to remember. Wellesley. We were in the same dormitory. Yes. Yes, of course. You were that girl who used to come to class barefoot. (laughs) They put you on probation for it, didn't they? (laughs) Somebody wrote a note to the dean about it. I wear them in public now, Mr. Henderson. But, uh... The band certainly is different. Yes, and Nicky and the boys play very well together. Nicky's the one playing the bongos. You know, up to a few months ago, he'd never studied music. Oh, it's quite remarkable. Yes, particularly when you consider that before that, he used to work in an herb shop. Uh, looks to me as if he's eaten one herb too many. <laughs> That's why he acts so creepy, I suppose. <laughs> no, it's not that at all. It's just that all the whole right, they're a little sinister. You see, Nicky's my brother. I'm terribly sorry. Uh, a waiter. Yes, sir. Uh, give us two more of those of vodka and tonic and scotch and soda. Yes, sir. You and I went to Wes- Wellesley together, and she, of course, you were the one that didn't wear shoes. You were barefoot. And she goes, yeah, and you're the one who, like, told the dean about it. And then she tells the story like, oh, didn't you used to be afraid of thunderstorms? And then she created a thunderstorm every day for like four months to drive her crazy. But what is this world where you can get kicked out of school for being barefoot? I mean, (laughs) there's a lot we could say about controlling women and trying to control women and the themes here, you know, women in power, unchecked, maybe that's the I don't know. But, you know, she's that girl, that chick that just gets people in trouble because she can. We don't like her. But she's going to marry Jimmy Stewart. And then Jimmy Stewart and uh, Kim Novak get to talking. And uh, she brings him to her apartment. And that's when she decides she's going to... Uh, the spell that she puts on him... Uh, once again, the, the photography, the cinematography in this movie is spectacular. The cat purring and purring louder and louder as the, and then you get the cat yeah. eyes focus on oh. Jimmy Stewart and you get I mean there's none of that in the play it's literally just like a little bit of mumbling mm-hmm. and she's holding the cat and that's it and that's all that happens just like in there magic <laughs> <laughs> We also should say it's Jimmy Stewart is a publisher, and he hears that there's this 
this book in Mexico. He goes, I was in Mexico looking for a guy. I couldn't find him. And she's like, oh, well, who are you looking for? Maybe, you know, I could find out. And he's basically, he compares it like the popularity to the Kinsey report, which is also like, ooh, racy. Cause that's a. And another thing about Edie Adams, I think it's Edie Adams. You just reminded me. I, the, the whole Ernie Kovacs, Edie Adams of it all is he, so fast. Ernie Kovacs, by the way, when um my friend used to be the PR person for the Museum of Television Radio, and this is before there was a YouTube, and she said the number of comedians that would come in just to watch Ernie Kovacs clips, because he influenced John yeah, Carson, everybody. but like David Letterman, all of them worshipped Ernie Kovacs. Like he was just doing something spectacular with television, especially the equipment that they had at the time and what was available. So his appearance in the movie is just this rumpled, weird writer from Mexico who just sort of finds his way to New York because she conjures it. Yeah. It's incredible. I'm trying to find it here. I think, if I remember correctly, Edie Adams, give me a second. Yes. Okay, so she was studying at Juilliard, and she was one of the first women to be interviewed for the Kinsey Report. Oh, my goodness. I didn't know this. Oh on top God. of everything else. I've never seen that show. There was a show about the Kinseys, right? Oh, I- yeah. We watched it. Master, no, that's Masters and Johnson. Um, the Kinsey one was the one with Liam Neeson. I can't remember. But Liam Neeson and I think, like, John Lithgow played his oppressive father. He's, like, John Lithgow's everybody's oppressive <laughs> father. Um, and he's, like, the nicest man. Like, when you see interviews of he's him. He's a sweetheart. He's a sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, the Kinsey Report, for those of you who are not aware of what we're talking about, it was this kind of... It was the first real American kind of attempt, clinical attempt to look at human sexuality and and definitively um, categorize like a like a what do I want to say like a spectrum of of human sexuality. It was it's very primitive, <laughs> for lack of a better word, um, but it's the first kind of real attempt at this and 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 to really look at it from a scientific point of view and and not a like um, shame based, uh, religiously driven, norms driven point of view. It's like, let's really look at what is actually going on in human sexuality um, so that we can, um, you know, basically better, you know, better address these issues as doctors. But of course, because it, Americans being Americans and as repressed <laughs> as we are, like, ooh, it's a book about sex. <laughs> And so everybody had to read this book about sex that said that gay people exist. Oh, and, and masturbation is okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, that's the little bit of raciness, honestly, that we get in this movie. So he brings in Ernie Kovacs, who's great. You know, just, I, it's so sad what happened with him. Jillian and Nikki quarreling about, like, she, so they bring in this this writer, Gillian, excuse me, is very upset because she doesn't want to get too many of the secrets out because look what happens to witches when they get exposed. They're quarreling about all of this. Shep is losing interest in everything because he's so obsessed and Twitter-pated with yes. her. He's under a spell. He's, so all he wants to do is look at Kim Novak. We don't blame him. No, she's beautiful. I mean, and 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 but uh, but he's losing interest in the other things. And then he's saying to her, "We got to get married." And that's she's like, "Don't I don't know if I she's want like, that." Whoa, dude! Yeah. What you don't want to get married to me? I'm selfish. I'm I do what I want to do. You, this is not going to work for you. And he's like, doesn't want to be talked out of it. He's like, no, no, no. And then she's like, "Well, aren't you already engaged?" So he tells Janice. Uh, hi, I'm breaking up with you. Sorry about that. I'm love. I'm in love with someone else, but that just leaves you open for another man. So I'm doing you a favor, really. <laughs> you don't want to marry me. I, I suck. Love Kim Novak. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just gonna have to. And that's and Kim Novak is kind of freaking out because also she's losing. It's losing her power. I mean, she has this life where she can make whatever she wants for herself. She's really into art. She's into history. She's into anthropology, she fashion. Travels. She travels. Yeah. She loves music. She's got this great life. And it's a reason why some people don't get married because they like that freedom. And she's like, okay, but if I do get married and if I, I become human, I therefore will experience pain. I'll experience loss. 
and I won't be able to make all the crap that I love. It's a lot to give up. It's a lot to also take in. What if this really isn't real? What if I made just, it was just a spell and maybe that's all this is, you know? So she, she doesn't know. So she's very, very conflicted over this. But they eventually the spell does, they go to a woman, Bianca de Pass, who's Hermione Gingold, and the gentlemen go to visit her, and she's like in Connecticut or something, but she comes up with this soup that Jimmy Stewart has to drink to kind of get the spell off of him, because they're they're like, this guy's got it too bad. He's not taking no for an answer. You know, we need him, we need him to publish our book. We need him to like get it together. So he goes and he takes it, and then he comes back, and then he's so upset with her, like, you put a spell on me, how dare you? They have this big argument, and he takes out a broom, and he gives it to her, like... Ha! Which, now you take this. I heard about last night, Jeff. Oh, well, what did you go there for? For the hair of the dog that bit me. That's why. Now, listen, I don't want to be here. And I wouldn't be, except that old bag said that the treatment wouldn't be complete until I confronted you. Well, nice of her to make that a condition. Oh, and she told me to tell you that in case you have anything further in mind, she's fixed it so you can't undo this one. Yes, and just how did she do that? Why, well, I, she said it was something she put in that disgusting mess she made me drink. Ooh, I've never been so humiliated in all my life to say nothing of the money it cost me. Why, what did she charge? A thousand dollars. What? A thousand dollars. At least she was willing to take a check. And she also pointed out to me that if we'd gotten married, it would have cost a lot more than that to get divorced. Well, that's a pretty comparison. Yeah, but it's a good one. Pretty good one, not bad, pretty good. And now, if you'll forgive me, I think I'll be going. Believe me, I've had my fill of this bell book and candle set. It really wasn't necessary for you to move, Chef. Oh, yes, it was. Of course, I may have a little trouble subletting. This isn't the kind of a house that I could wholeheartedly recommend to anybody. Good day. You mean goodbye? That's right. I'll never see you again. Well, I can't see what for. I suppose you'll go back tomorrow. Perhaps, if she'll have me. Oh, I forgot. I'm going to a hotel, so I won't be needing this. But maybe you might, in case you ever get sick of the primitive art business. Have broom, we'll travel. So, a trip to the Brooklyn Harpy, a visit to me, a final moronic joke, and away we go. It's that easy, is it? <laughs> Go back to Merle Kittredge, will you? Not if I have anything to say about it. Perhaps you're defrosted, but I haven't even begun with her. Oh, Gillian, I... Let's see, what would be fancy enough? I'll transport her. Before I'm through with her, she'll see more geography than Marco Polo. And you needn't try to chase after... (laughs) And she's heartbroken, but she lets him go. In the meantime, the the cat Piwack Piwacket was is is her familiar familiar, mm-hmm. and so now the the cat is realizing she's human. The hats the cat's just going to go to their next one, so he leaves her or she. We don't know what Piwacket steal it's is. True, mm, we, yeah. But that scene breaks my heart because just like in Breakfast at Tiffany's, what she loses, it's, it's, it's like, very that. It's very that. I'm like, no, you can't let the cat go. And the cat's got a little bell on it. And yeah. so Jimmy Stewart's back in publishing and he tells them their book is terrible. You know, we got you got to start over. Come up with another idea. He's yelling at his assistant, his his sweet assistant. He's just barking at her. And then the cat just shows up at his window, literally at his window. And he puts the cat in a waste paper basket and because it doesn't have a cat carrier, of course not. Mm-hmm. But he brings it back to Kim, and she's now has a flower shop. Like she got rid of all the cool decorations. She got all, rid of all of her artifacts, and she's selling. She's now selling. I mean, granted, I mean they're very well made. Yeah, but she's selling um, flowers of the sea. So. Um, shells floral sculptures made out of shells out of seashells which just as a former interior designer let me just say (laughs) that's a a word of advice if you you must have one just stick to one you don't need more than one in your house just just one 
Just one's good. Um, so I can't imagine that they're like selling like hotcakes. I would imagine she'd have a bigger market for her her other uh, store. But um, but I guess now that she doesn't have uh, witchy magic and charm, she's selling <laughs> Hours of the sea, and she's wearing white, and she just, she's wearing white. I, I forgot to mention, looks beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous. Are you doing well? Yes, very. How are things with you? Fine. Good. How's Merle? She's fine. Fine. I guess I haven't seen much of her lately. I must say, it was decent of you not to hex her after all. Would you think better of it? Yes. Yeah, it's extraordinary the way we can discuss things like this. Isn't it? Because... Uh, I know, I know. We're, we're strangers to each other. No, not quite that. I wish you wouldn't stare at me so. Gail, you're not blushing. Of course not. I want you to have this. It, well, it's small return for, for what I cost you. So little compared to what you gave me. I'm afraid I never gave you much of anything. Oh, yes, yes, you did. You, you gave me something wonderful. You, <laughs> you made me unhappy. Crying too. All right, I'm crying. Well, why didn't you come and tell me? I don't know. Pride, I guess, or shame. Well, how did it happen? It just happened. It does sometimes. No, it, it only happens one way. The story is it only happens if you fall in love. And it's been happening to me too, Gil. It's ever since I walked in here. Only it's real this time. Oh, shit. Forgot to mention, there's a scene in Jimmy Stewart's office. There's this, like, horse sculpture that's on his desk. And I was like, that cannot be. That cannot be. And I looked it up. It is the same thing that you see in the Brady Bunch in their house. I was going to say it's the Brady horse. <laughs> it's the, Bra the Brady horse. Mom said don't play ball in the house. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've seen that thing forever. The most ill-conceived house ever is that house, but it's... They probably just had it in a prop warehouse, and then when they were making the Brady Bunch, they are like, ah, eh, let's grab this. I think it's a Paramount it's probably production. probably the same exact horse. Yeah, was, you know, so I'm sure... Yeah, exactly. It, it, I'm, I'm certain. So anyway, he comes back to see her. He returns the cat to her. It, it, she says, oh, it's no longer my cat. It belongs to, to Aunt Queenie. But then that's when they she starts having tears. And, and she showed Queenie her tears. Like, she's tr truly fully human now. And that's when he says, you know, they realize that they love each other and they, they have to be together. And so they they get together. And Nikki's disgusted because he likes her as a witch. You know, he's a warlock. And then all of a sudden the streetlights go out outside. And that's when you see Pywick on top of the lamp. Like Pywick's just running the show now. I, and I, I love it. Them making out it. on the couch, by the way, with their bare feet is like the sexiest thing. Oh. I mean, this, there's so much going on here, y'all. But it's so visually beautiful. It's, it's gorgeous. It's a gorgeous it's absolutely movie. absolutely gorgeous. And it's, you go through all the emotions with them. Um you know, I, yeah, I mean, a part of me is just like, God, she's giving up so much. But then it's like, yeah, but it's Jimmy Stewart. It's not like. <laughs> I know. And also, and also like it's but it's also too that like unlike you and I who grew up watching Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie, at no point is Jimmy Stewart like now hide your witchcraft. Like, yes. Don't let anybody know you're a witch. He, he, like, again, the witch thing is never a problem with him. That's never an issue with him. He's just mad that she lied. Right. And that, that she was, her interest in him was the revenge that she could get on um, Janice Rule, which is totally valid. And so, um, so yeah, so then I'm not, I'm not mad about it at the end that she, um, that they're together and that she 
she knew that she if she fell in love that she that was something that could happen. I, I it's great. It's so good. It's so good. And that Christmas tree, darn it! Oh, it's it's. Where is it? Where is this tree? It needs to be in Why a museum. Why is it on Etsy? Is it? I'm gonna look. Yeah, look up that Christmas tree. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> It does really well. It was nominated for two categories, Best Art Direction and for Best Costume Design. And it was also, it received a Golden Globe nomination for Best Motion Picture Comedy. It didn't win. They don't all win that, you know, that we watch. But it's, uh, it's a classic for a reason. It's a weird little movie. Like Margot says, like a lot of people think it's a Halloween movie because it's about a witch, but it's... It's not, but it is the inspiration for Bewitched. And, and uh, it is, you know, a story about women in power. I love it. Did you find your... It's not on Etsy. What? You can't buy it anywhere on the internet. Well, I feel very disappointed. Margo's crushed. I feel very disappointed. Etsy people, come on. Let's yeah. get it together. Let's make it happen. I will buy it. I will buy it. Don't make me have to make this myself because <laughs> I could, I could, I just don't have the time or the patience. Dang it. I know. <laughs> I want that tree. Um, even a little one. I would be so happy. Um, yeah, it's, it's, and it is, it is just the right amount of Christmassy. Mm-hmm. It's just a, just a, a lovely little, lovely little icing of Christmassy. Um, goodness. So book or movie? Movie. Yeah, totally movie. Yeah. Um, the Zodiac now, Club. If for no other Zo- reason, I, I'm like... Game over. Game over. Yeah. yeah. But her Seriously. wardrobe is Ugh. to die. It's such a great movie. The, the, she's so good. She really you is. Know, she really is underrated. I mean, and I get it. She's devastatingly beautiful. Um, it, that it's, it, it confuses us. Um, but, and we lose sight of how amazingly good, um, she is. Yeah, man. And the two of them, ugh. it's Jimmy Stewart's last romantic role. After that, he sort of mm. played the every man or the grandpa or, or Westerns, whatever. Westerns, a lot of Westerns, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. but it, it's a so, slice of special. It's great. Oh, it's so good. Um, okay. Look, so as we <laughs> said, this, this movie has just like, it's just like a beautiful, just a, a, a lovely chiffon scarf of, of Christmas, you know, in this fun witchy production. Now, the the next movie that we're going to cover is going to whack you across the face, <laughs> kick you in the behind into the street, and then run you over with Christmas. Just be warned. We're covering, it's a Dolly Parton song turned into a movie. And it is called, what is it called, Margot? Christmas in the Square. It is called Christmas on the Square. On the Square. Directed by, you want fame? Well, fame costs. <laughs> and right here is where you start paying. It's, it's Debbie sweet. Allen. It's sweet. <laughs> and Debbie Allen. Treat Williams, RIP. He's in this. It's on Netflix. Christine Baranski. Christine Baranski. Out of this town. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be. the baddie. It's it's Jennifer Lewis. Jennifer Lewis. It's a great cast. And by the way, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton, who has the number one album as we speak, rock star. She's amazing. So that's what we're covering next. It's available on Netflix. I'm sure you can stream it in other places too, because I think it's from 2020. We're very excited. After that, we're doing Miracle on 34th Street. That's also going to hit your head with Christmas, but probably not as much <laughs> as this no, one. No, this is, oh, this is really... Yeah, just just buckle up. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. For the one after that, like if y'all have ideas for New Year's, maybe like a New Year. We already covered the Poseidon Adventure. We 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 did we did cover that. But also winter's coming up. Musicals in March. We have just all kinds of things coming up. We have 2024. I can't believe it's gonna be 2024, Margo, in a few weeks. Oh my god. Oh. I'm I'm shocked and also a little glad. It's been a year. It's been a, a crazy year. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It's just been a lot. It's Not bad, been. just a lot. It's a lot. All right, y'all. So all those places I mentioned at the top of the show, please send us your suggestions. We love hearing from you. And uh, once again, the email, book versus movie podcast at gmail.com. And if you'd like some stickers, let us know. We'll drop them in the mail for you. Margo, where can they find you? 
You can find me online at colonialbook.com and all my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you? You can find me at brooklynfitchick.com. I'm also Brooklyn Fit Chick for Twitter, as long as that exists. Instagram and threads, everything else is Brooklyn Margo, including my TikTok, where I have many clips of this movie on there and it has lots of fans. I found people right away that were notifying me how much they enjoy it. Okay, everyone, we'll be back soon with a new episode. Thank you so much for listening to the Book vs. Movie Podcast. We're a part of the Frolic Podcast Network. You could find more podcasts you will love at frolic.media forward slash podcasts. You could find us on Twitter, Threads, Blue Sky, and Instagram at Book vs. A Movie. Just spell it all out. We have a Patreon page. Type in there Book vs. Movie Podcast, where you can find eight years worth of shows. You can follow Margot D on social media at Brooklyn Margot and also Brooklyn Fitchick. You can find Margot P at She's Nacho Mama. Thank you again for listening and please be sure to send along your suggestions for the show. Remember, the book needs to be easy to get your hands on and the movie has to be streaming on a major platform. We will be back soon with a new episode. <laughs>